one of these young men will pass out these sort of award magazines, newspapers for you. They're, you read them at home, not during the sermon. All right. We want to turn to Proverbs 14. And while we do, I just want to make a note for one of our members that needs prayer today, and that's Brother Art Schwartz. He has pneumonia, and he's missed the entire week of work. Um, he's a truck driver, so maybe that's a good thing. Because, boy, we come back from Ohio on uh, Friday, and there were like semi-trucks tipped over in the, you know, on the field. I don't know how they get so far out in the field. They must be traveling to get before they stop out there. But, man, it was something. Wow. Well, let's pray for Art Schwartz. Art Schwartz and his pneumonia. And uh, Art's a, a blessing, and he's, uh, he has one of those CDL licenses and passenger endorsement, and he's going to try to help us start a bus route this year, a little bit down in South Buffalo. And uh, let's pray that he gets well soon here, okay? Art Schwartz, pray for him. I want you to pray for him, too, because he's the only other Art in the church. There's only two of us left, <laughs> and so we need him around. Amen. Proverbs 14.10 says this, The heart knoweth his own bitterness, and a stranger doth not intermeddle with his joy. And I want to talk about that. I've talked about this a few times in the past. I think about two other times I've brought a message similar to this about the importance of intermeddling with your joy. And uh, it, to me, is one of the greatest secrets to victory in the Christian life is to intermeddle with your joy. Um, the first part of the verse, these are the Proverbs of Solomon. He wrote about 3,000 of them. About 800 of them are recorded for us in the book of Proverbs. Um, they're, they're so amazing that I've, I've often challenged people to come up with a proverb yourself that's original with you that nobody else has ever thought of. A wise saying. Just one. Try it someday. Just try to come up with a wise saying that nobody else has ever thought of before. Well, Solomon did 3,000. You know why? He prayed to God that God would give him an understanding heart. So these are not the Proverbs of Solomon. These are the, the, the Proverbs of God through Solomon. This is what God showed him. And what a great verse this is here. My wife and I, when we first got married, used to read through the book of Proverbs constantly. We've been married 39 years, but the first six years, we, we read a, a chapter out of Proverbs every single day uh, of the month. And then by the end of the month, there's 31 Proverbs you're through the book. And the next month, we'd start over, and the next month, we'd start over. And we, we read through the book of Proverbs together in our new marriage 72 times the first six years, and it really helped us. I, I want to stress to you the importance of reading the book of Proverbs for wisdom. And it really, that book made most of our decisions for us. Uh, we didn't have to pray much about decisions. It gave us the wisdom already in the Word on so many subjects. If you'll get familiar with it, and it's especially written to young people and young adults and early, getting started early in life, familiarize yourself with the book of Proverbs. And this is one that jumped out uh, of the pages of the Bible into my heart uh, very early, even before I became a pastor, which has been these last 35 years. The heart knoweth his own bitterness, and a stranger doth not intermeddle with his joy. Uh, people are very familiar with bitterness. The heart knoweth his own bitterness. In fact, I would say the human race... They're probably experts on bitterness. It seems like everybody's got a sob story. It seems like everybody's a victim. And I'm not talking about so much us here in church. I'm just saying in general. It seems like everybody's a victim. Uh, man, I hear people going way back and condemning Christopher Columbus for what he did in the 1400s and how that affects their life today. What, what's that about? You know, we're going back to the Civil War and back in this, and, 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 and they're still bitter over things that happened centuries ago, literally. The heart knoweth his own bitterness. Bitterness is a, a root that can spring up in you and trouble you, and it affects a lot of people. 
Uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, I'll read this. It says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Uh, the Bible uses the word many to, uh, uh, to illustrate the number of human beings who are defiled by bitterness. The heart knoweth its own bitterness, our verse says, means a lot of people dwell on bitter things in their heart. Uh, their hearts are experts at bitterness. You know, I should have got that job, or why couldn't I look as nice as her, or as nice as him, or, or, or how come I don't have money, or my health is, is bad, and, and my dad deserted us, and my mom died, and, and um, uh, you know, I, I'm a victim, and, and it just goes on and on and on of people who spend their whole lives in bitterness, and they have, they have fabricated, and the first part of the verse says they've become experts, basically, uh, at being victims, at knowing their own bitterness. And as a result, they become strangers to the medicine that can help their souls, and that is joy. Joy. Do you ever try living the life of a victim? There's no joy in it. I remember my de mom died when I was four. She had cancer. She died. And, and so I, I struggled with that for a long time. And the things that happened to our family and the whole thing just kind of fell apart there. It, just was, it was just crazy and dysfunctional. And I know what it's like to dwell in bitterness uh, and woe is me and depression and all the symptoms that go along with it, despondency. But that's no way to live. God has a better way to live for us. And it's in the second part of this verse, and it's the importance that you and I intermeddle with our joy. It says, a stranger doth not intermeddle with his joy. So don't be a stranger. Don't be a, a stranger. Now, this word intermeddle here means to engage with, to occupy oneself with their joy. Occupy yourself. Don't ignore it. Don't be a stranger to it, but intermeddle with it. Uh, get involved with your joy. Now, here's the blessing that I found. In Nehemiah 8 and verse 10, it says this, The joy of the Lord is your strength. So joy gives us strength. But if we don't intermeddle with our joy, we won't get the strength that accompanies it, and life will be hard. Life will be hard. It's hard when you don't have any strength. You have to try to go through life in the flesh, and you wear out. You get burned out. It's tough. You need to intermeddle with your joy, and I need to intermeddle with my joy. And I'm going to give you about 10 things here real quick that I'm going to go through that produce joy, promised. Promised by God to produce joy. You might want to write them down on the back of your bulletin. Now, it's okay to get this information in your head, but boy, you got to get it down in your heart. I'm telling you, this is one of the secrets uh, that God has allowed me to practice that's kept me going all these years. In the uh, bulletin uh, over at Hilltop Baptist, I was there this morning preaching. Got a little article here. It says, pray for your pastor. And be an encouragement to him. 97% of pastors, I don't know where he got these statistics from, but. 97% of pastors have been betrayed, falsely accused, or hurt by their trusted friends. 70% of pastors battle depression. 7,000 churches close each year. 1,500 pastors quit uh, each month. 10% will retire as a pastor. Only one out of 10 that starts finishes. 80% of pastors feel discouraged. 94% of pastors' families feel the pressure of the ministry. 78% percent of pastors have no close friends. 90% of pastors report working 55 to 75 hours per week. Well, I was looking at that there and it just kind of, it was kind of strange to me. I enjoy the ministry. And something has kept me going for 35 years. Now all those things that they mention in the statistics, you know, I, I think I probably experienced a lot of them, but 
Something's kept me going for 35 years. And the truth of this verse is one of those things. I have learned how to intermeddle with my joy. So whether people come to church or not, or people follow on and walk in the will of the Lord or not, or, you know, it's, I'm going to still intermeddle with my joy. I'm going to intermeddle with my joy. And that has kept me going. I don't feel like quitting. I don't even feel like retiring. I don't even know what that word means. I love, I love what I'm doing. I'm looking to the, forward to the future with expectation and, and hope and vision. And I, I think it's going to be great. I don't know. But I'm telling you, this works right here. The second part of this verse right here works when you learn how to work it. A stranger doth not intermeddle with his joy. So don't be a stranger. The sermon this morning is simply this. Intermeddle with your joy. Intermeddle, get involved, get entangled with uh, your joy. Occupy yourself with the things that God has given you that can bring you joy. Now, here's some things. I'm going to give you 10 of them if you want to write these down. Number one is salvation. Number one is salvation. Intermeddle with salvation. If you don't know what it's like to be saved, you need to be saved because in being saved, there is joy, and it just doesn't seem to wear off. I like being saved. I don't know about you. I got saved when I was 12 years old. Still remember the day like it just happened. Still remember the pastor preaching. Still remember the verse that God used to touch my heart when Jesus said in John 10 and verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And I can still remember the seat. I could take you to the little church in the country where I was standing during the invitation. I can point to the seat and I said I was standing right there when I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior, to come into my heart and to come into my life and save me in repentance and faith. I believed on Christ and received him that day. And, and uh, he's been with me ever since. Uh, now that's this November, that will be 40 years, or, or uh, 50 years ago that that happened. 50 years. And I still have the joy of salvation. I intermeddle with that. I have not gotten over my salvation. Don't get over your salvation. Uh, have a testimony. If you don't, make sure today is the day. January 27th, 2019. At the Faith Bible Baptist Church in Eden, New York, I trusted Christ as my Savior. That could be your testimony today. Not, nobody has to leave without Christ as their Savior. When David sinned, and that was bad, he committed adultery with a woman that wasn't his wife named Bathsheba. If anything good came out of it, it was the 51st Psalm where he confessed his sin. And we can learn from that how to confess our sins. But one of the things he prayed in his prayer of confession, in Psalm 51, verse 12, he said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. See, salvation gives us joy. You've got to intermeddle with that. You've got to make sure you're saved. You know, don't, don't worry. You don't, don't say, well, everybody thinks I'm saved. Or my mom and dad think I'm saved, but I'm not. Well, the only thing that matters is you, between you and God. Make sure you're saved. And I assure you, if you're really saved, if you've ever trusted Christ as your Savior, you have experienced the joy of that salvation. Intermeddle with that joy. Uh, don't be a stranger to it. It's there for you. God wants you to enjoy your salvation for the rest of your life. Isaiah 12, 3 says, Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. Don't get over your testimony. Don't get over the day of your salvation. Number two, the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord. You know, being saved is great, but there's times of, and seasons in the, the Christian life where, like David, we sin, we grieve the Holy Ghost, we quench the Holy Ghost. Maybe we, 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 we feel guilty and embarrassed and full of shame and conviction and anything except joy. But, you know, you can run into the presence of the Lord and he'll receive you. 
See, he came looking for Adam and Eve. They didn't come looking for him. And God's looking for us today. If we've fallen, you've had a bad week or bad year so far in your walk with the Lord, God's looking for you. He wants to, he wants to restore that fellowship. He wants to be close uh, to you. One of my favorite verses about the presence of the Lord is Psalm 16, verse 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, that verse doesn't say wait till heaven and there's fullness of joy and in thy presence is pleasures forevermore. No, that's now. You and I can practice the presence of the Lord. We need to intermeddle with the presence of the Lord, and in so doing, it says, in thy presence is what? Fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, who's at the right hand of, G of God? Jesus Christ. You see, there is fullness of joy and, and, and pleasures forevermore if we'll live in the presence of God. So James the apostle says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. We can be as close to the Lord today as we want. And as you live in the presence of the Lord and intermeddle uh, with the Lord, you'll have fullness of joy. Now, the world doesn't know that. The world thinks, boy, if I come to Christ, and if I get close to God, I'll never smile again. I'll never be happy again. I'll never laugh again. Really, before we're saved, it seems like we have this picture of God being some cosmic killjoy in heaven uh, who's, who's got a, a clipboard out and, and he says, you know, they're smiling too much down there in Eden. I better write a bunch of rules and knock that off. And off. No smiling. Some people think of God that way. Just, just made a bunch of rules to make sure we're never happy again. No, it's not like that. His rules, by the way, are good for us. They're the guardrails of life. I wouldn't want to go over the skyway without guardrails, would you? And you don't want to go through life without morals and rules to help you and to protect you, to keep you safe. That's what they're for. His rules are to keep us safe. It can be a pleasure going over the skyway sometimes. Not now, but, but uh, you get a good view up there. And it's the same thing. If we can stay in the highway, you know, in, in, in God's or guardrails or keeping us safe, traveling through this life can be an enjoyable experience. And the presence of the Lord can give us fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. Are you getting close to the Lord? Are you intermeddling? Or are you kind of staying away? Eh, let's keep our distance, God. You and me, I'm glad I'm saved. But No, no. Number three, the filling of the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit. Number three, intermeddle with the filling of the Holy Spirit, and that'll bring you joy. There are nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit taught to us in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. What are they? What's the first one? What's the second one? Okay, let's stop there. What's the second one? Joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Joy. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, to be filled with the Spirit, we've got to be emptied of self, and we've got to be emptied of sin, and filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit, and then His fruit begins to grow in us, the characteristics of His fruit, and we start to have joy. Romans 14 and verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Are you meddling with the Holy Spirit? Unfortunately, the Holy Spirit is often the mystery man of the Trinity. People are familiar with God the Father. They're familiar with God the Son, but God the Holy Spirit's like a mystery. No, he's a person. He's not a mystery. He's the third person of the Trinity. And just as some of you have wonderful communion with God the Father, keep it up. And you have wonderful communion with God the Son. Keep it up. Do you have any communion with God, the Holy Ghost? And yet in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, it says, The communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. That's what it says. 
Communion is the deepest word in the scriptures for fellowship. It's really intimate fellowship. You can tell the Holy Ghost anything. I have. I've told him things I wouldn't dare say about myself from the pulpit. But I said, Holy Spirit, you know all this anyway. Help me. And boy, what a help he has been to me. Do you have communion with the Holy Ghost? Do you intermeddle with the Holy Ghost? Do you intermeddle with your joy? Don't be a stranger to the Holy Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Number four, prayer. How's your prayer life? Are you intermeddling with the discipline of prayer? Prayer. Well, what's that got to do with joy? Well, Jesus said these words in uh, John chapter number 16 and verse 24. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Wow. You getting a, the picture here? Not just joy, but fullness of joy. Did you ever get a prayer answered? I hope so. Isn't it neat? Doesn't it give you joy when you ask for something? And you know, the neatest ones are the small ones. Uh, they're the small ones when you pray for something and, 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 and all of a sudden God gives it to you. And you say, wow, that was personal. And the Lord answers prayer. Now, when did he say this? John 16, 24. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. He said this eh, about 12 hours before he was crucified. It's the last thing he said just about before he was crucified. He was concerned about our joy. He said, prior to this in history, you've never asked anything in my name. I want you to start asking in my name so your joy can be full. Jesus, before he was crucified, was thinking about us. What a Savior. What a Savior. You can't but help worship him. He was thinking about our joy. Do you pray? Do you kids pray? Boys and girls, you can pray. God answers prayer and not only do you receive the answer to the prayer, but the icing on the cake is the joy that comes with it. Giving. Giving is another way to be joyful, to intermeddle with joy. Don't be a miser. Do you know where we get the word miserable from? Misers. Misers aren't happy people. They get all they can and can all they get. They're miserable. Be a giver. Don't worry. You're not going to outgive the Lord. He's going to bless you for it. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, that's the Old Testament, verse 9, it says, Then the people rejoiced, for they offered willingly, because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord, and David the king also rejoiced with great joy. Man, they had something big going on here in David's day. They were getting ready to build the temple. Man, that was a big project. And boy, the people just started offering willingly. And as a result, they all started rejoicing. Hey, we can give uh, to a great cause, the, the cause of God, the work of God. Number seven is church. Church is supposed to be a source of joy. I guess it depends on what we make it. I hope it is. I like coming to church. Psalm 122, 1 says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It should fill our hearts with gladness. In Psalm 42 and verse number 4, 42, 4, uh, here's a great verse. It says, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Now there's one time where we should be a part of the multitude. I know it's a wintry Sunday here in Western New York. I understand that, but I hope our church will grow and grow and grow this year. And it says we can go, I don't know why, but it just gives me joy to go to the house of the Lord. I went to the house of the Lord Thursday down in Broadview Heights, Ohio for the first time ever. Boy, I had a lot of joy. 
going in there and meeting brothers and sisters in Christ that I've never met before in my life. But we're, we're the same. There's a kindred spirit. No matter where you go, I'm sure uh, Justin and Kaylee just left our church a couple weeks ago to Papua New Guinea. They're missionaries there. I got a feeling they, they've already established a kindred spirit with some of the brothers and sisters in the Lord in Papua New Guinea where they're serving as missionaries. There's just something unique about the church. It's a source of joy. It'll bless your heart. It's not perfect. In fact, it can get ugly sometimes. Any church gets ugly sometimes. So does your family. You don't quit your family, do you? Because it gets ugly. Same thing with church. But you know, church is a source of joy to us in a very difficult world. And I got a feeling this world's going to get worse if I'm reading the prophecies correct. We're going to need each other more and more and more and more and more. And when you come, bring joy with you. All right? Let it light up your face. Intermeddle with your joy. Go to church. Well, preaching to the choir. You're here on a wintry day. Soul winning. Number eight. Soul winning. Uh, witnessing. Testifying. Call it whatever you want. Leading somebody else to Christ. Listen, if you have never led someone else to Christ... You don't know what you're missing. That is a joy that doesn't go away. Because if they truly get saved, they receive eternal life. And that's a long, long time. Then you've done that person the greatest blessing you could possibly ever give to a person is introduce them to Jesus Christ so that they can come to know Christ as their Savior. My, oh, my, oh, my. I tell you what, if you've never led someone to Christ, intermeddle with soul winning. Let this be the year you intermeddle. Say, how do I do it? What do I say? Now, who do I go to? And, and how do I draw the net and try to get them to trust Christ as their Savior? Intermeddle with this. There's, there's no joy like it. I'm trying to find a verse here. Uh, first, uh, let's see if I can find it. First Thessalonians 2, 19. <clears throat> My voice is changing. And I caught something down there in Ohio. It's their fault, I guess. It says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Paul says, are not even ye in the presence of the Lord that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. He talks about a crown. He says, he says, what's my joy, my rejoicing? This church at Thessalonica, he went there. He was the missionary that planted the church. He led these people to Christ. And he said, what's my hope and joy of rejoicing? He says, you in the presence of the Lord. Can you imagine going to heaven? And there's a whole bunch of people there because you told them about Christ. You don't think that'll be a joy forever? Intermeddle with that joy. I don't care who you are. God can use you because it's not you. It's the gospel he uses to save people's souls. And if you'll just share the gospel, eventually you'll lead people to Christ. And there's no joy like it. Well, these other couple more here, but uh, let's see. Having wise children, let me just give you these last two. Now, these 10, this is not a complete Bible study. There's so many more. You can, you can enjoy out of marriage, right? Rejoice with the wife of thy youth. I haven't talked about that. And there's a lot of other things you can intermeddle with that'll give you joy. And when you get joy, you'll get strength. And when you get strength, you will finish the course. You will not quit. You will not give up. You will not get burnt out. You will not get worn down. You can be, for instance, a joyful mother of children, the Bible says. You can be a joyful mother of children. And that'll give you strength. So your kids grow up to know the Lord, love the Lord, serve the Lord. And, and then as you're getting older, they're doing God's work. Man, I was down uh, Pastor Royalty's church Thursday, and there was Ron Royalty, the dad, the patriarch. He's 72. And I got to thinking about him. He, here he is watching his son pastor the church watching his son's wife involved, watching his son's six children, all loving the Lord, all involved. And then all of his other kids are in other ministries, in missions field and stuff. 
I, got, I, I was looking at him Thursday night and said, now that man must have a joy just to sit and be a spectator and watch his kids and his grandkids. Wise children. Number nine, wise children. Proverbs 23, 24 says this, The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. But take that into the spiritual realm. The Apostle John said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So you could be talking about children in your family or children in God's family that you've birthed into them through the gospel. There's no greater joy when you get to lead people to Christ and they keep walking in truth. And last of all, I'll turn to Proverbs 15, 23. <coughs> and by the way, you kids, try to be a joy to your parents. That'll put strength in your mom. That'll put strength in your dad. It'll make their life a little bit easier. They're doing a lot to take care of you, you know. They really are. Your moms and dads. Try to be a joy to grandma and grandpa. And uh, you, we, we all affect others. The, the scripture says, no man lives to himself, no man dies to himself. We're all affecting other people. So try to be a joy to someone else. Try to be a joy to the cashier at Walmart. Or the guy out freezing, pumping your gas. Try to be a joy to him. Put some strength in him. Help him through life. Help somebody today. We just sang that, right? Somebody along life's way. Let sorrow be ended. The friendless befriended. Oh, help somebody today. Well, this verse should see, seem familiar because you all have it memorized. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth. Right, because it's on our plaque right there. We can't see it, but that's our memory verse for January. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season. How good is it? Be a student. Intermeddle. Like we said in the Bible, try to find answers. People got questions. They've got legitimate questions. They should be able to come up to us and say, why do you think you're right? They should be able to. They should, and we should be able to show them, not proudly, no pride, ever. Be humble. Be meek when you answer people. But a man hath joy by the answer of his mouth. So intermeddle with your joy. Intermeddle. Learn some answers. That's what we're doing on Wednesday nights. We're learning answers. So we can answer people's questions. And people got good questions. And whether they ask them humbly or contentiously, we can still answer them and help people. Help people. A man, we had a funeral here about a month ago, and I shared the gospel. And I told people, this is how you can be saved. Believe, receive Christ as your Savior. You can pray and call on the Lord to receive you as your Savior. and re Receive him as your Savior. And I led in a word of prayer for people to trust Christ. And a guy came up to me right after the funeral was over and says, thank you for sharing that with me. I have wondered all my life how to do that. All my life, I've wondered how to do that. And he accepted. I said, did you ask Christ to be your Savior and believe? Yes. He said, I did. Do you think that didn't give me joy? A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth. We can show people. We know, how, we know how, what someone needs to do to be saved. We have that answer. It's Christ. And you share that answer. And there's so many other things. You moms, you know what I love it? I love it when I hear some kid grow up and say, my mom taught me everything I knew, everything I know. Or they'll say, my dad taught me everything I know. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Doesn't that just give a mom joy? Doesn't that just give a dad joy? And when you get joy, you get strength. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. As we've seen about 10 things that you said, that if we intermeddle with them, we'll have joy. And if we have joy, we'll have strength. And if we have strength, we can go through the worst seasons of our life and still be on top side. And not cave in and not fall and not give up and not quit and not become despondent or despair or bitter. 
Lord, people are experts today at bitterness and how hard it is for them. But Lord, you've given us medicine called joy, but we've got to intermeddle with it. Father, this sermon does nothing unless we get it from our head to our heart and start intermeddling with these things. But if we have joy, we can survive bad marriages, bad families, bad jobs, bad health, bad finances, bad politics, bad decisions, loss of jobs, everything. We can survive it if we have joy. If our kids go astray, we can still have the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. Oh, God, help us. Lord, uh, intermeddle, not be strangers to our joy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have Pastor uh, uh, Seth come and sing a song of invitation. It says 129. I guess we can use that at the cross. Maybe you don't know the Lord is your Savior. You've never been to the cross by faith. If while we're singing, if you come to the front or go to the back, somebody would be glad to take the Bible and just show you how you can know for sure that you have eternal life. That's the most important thing. Your ride will wait. It won't take long. Uh, but you can trust in Christ as your Savior. If you got anything else to come and pray about, we always have an altar call at our church. Maybe these things about joy, you say, man, I haven't been getting with it. i got to quit complaining. All right? I'm not going to be a victim anymore. I want to live on top side. I want, I want the victory. And maybe you just want to come and just spend a little time between you and God at the altar and pray about these things. And then Jacob's going to get baptized. So 129, let's stand and sing at the cross. 129, at the cross. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign.